as we turn now to a stunning new exposé, published today in The Intercept, about the elite military unit SEAL Team 6. Known as the president's own, the group is best known for killing Osama bin Laden, as well as other high-profile rescue missions, including that of Captain Richard Phillips from the Maersk, Alabama. But Intercept national security reporter Matthew Cole reveals a darker side of the celebrated group. Cole spent more than two years investigating accounts of ghastly atrocities committed by members of the unit, including mutilating corpses, skinnings and attempted beheadings. According to sources, senior command staff were aware of the misconduct, but did little to stop it and often helped to cover it up. In the article, The Crimes of SEAL Team 6, Cole quotes one former leader as saying, you can't win an investigation on us, you don't whistleblow on the teams, and when you win on the battlefield, you don't lose investigations. Well, for more, we're joined by Matthew Cole. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you, Amy. Talk about what you found, what we don't know about, and if there's much we don't know about this unit. Yeah, I think the the the, uh, the biggest takeaway is is that after 15 years of war and unquestionable successes on the battlefield, there have been virtually no accounts of SEAL Team Six um, outside of the parameters of uh, heroism. And they've become almost mythic uh, in terms of uh, the American public and, and, and how popular they are. And what, what was missing from those accounts was that um, after 15 years of, of continuous warfare, very personal, up-close warfare, there were some very, very dark things that occurred in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere that were largely suppressed and hidden from the public and, and actually from the military itself uh, as a way of uh, protecting the command and uh, those who had gone over the line to uh, commit war crimes. So talk about the bombing that occurred. Uh, you write about it um, in the opening part of this very lengthy article in Afghanistan. Yeah. So uh, in March of uh, 2002, there was a uh, operation that was uh, JSOC was, uh, had video footage of a, a tall man in, in white garb. That's joint, joint Special Operations Command. Joint Special Operations Command, and uh, saw someone that they thought was bin Laden and was afraid he was going to get away. They didn't have much intelligence, but they had the notion that uh, he was, uh, people around him were showing deference um, and he was leaving a compound. So they sent SEAL Team 6 and some helicopters to go investigate, basically to do an interdiction. Uh, but fearing that uh, the convoy was going to get across the border into Pakistan before the SEALs would get there, um, JSOC officers uh, ordered a bombing, and they dropped two bombs uh, on the convoy. And they killed a lot of people uh, pretty quickly, uh, almost instantaneously. Um, <clears throat> as the helicopters were coming down onto the scene, they then fired um, their the helicopter guns, miniguns, onto the remaining uh, survivors, if, regardless of whether they were armed, because it was all presumed that everyone there was, was al-Qaeda. When the SEALs got down onto the ground and inspected, what they found right away was that it was uh, all civilians, um, and that the men, the few men who, ha who were armed, were carrying family weapons, because in Afghanistan it's uh, traditional and customary for each male, at least, and certainly each family, to have one uh, weapon. And, in fact, what they saw were dead women and children, along with men. Um, and it was a horrific uh, sight for the SEALs, who were on their first deployment in the war. Um, you know, remember, this is right—this is shortly after 9-11 and shortly after the war in Afghanistan begins, and they weren't veterans yet of those kind of wars. Um, and according to uh, my sources, uh, the one of the officers who was on the mission uh, allegedly mutilated uh, one of the uh, victims, one of the civilian victims, um, after he had been uh, killed. And it was so upsetting to his teammate uh, in the unit that he then came back and reported it to his leader. And uh, what transpires then is a meeting with everyone in the unit who was enlisted and not the officers the next day to discuss battlefield ethics. How are we going to treat the dead? How are we going to conduct ourselves in the battlefield? And the decision uh, in the meeting was, hey, you know, one, one person who was there told me, you know, we shoot them and we move on. If they're, if they're bad guys, we shoot them and we move on. That's fine. But we don't mutilate. That's not part of the game. Um, and they essentially ostracized the officer who they believe had done so. Uh, but they didn't turn him in. They didn't report it. They didn't tell anyone. 
It was strictly within the unit. And that's one of the things— And it, the officer's name was? was his name was uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Vic Heider. Uh, and and uh, just to be clear, in the article on the record, he denies uh, that he uh, stomped this man's uh, head in. Um, but that story became, it really becomes a sort of uh, blueprint for how SEAL Team 6 has kept um, war crimes, excessive violence, criminal brutality a secret for 15 years. They keep it in-house. And they have their own system of justice, prison rules, if you will. Uh, and there is a real divide between the officers who have uh, the commission by law for law and order and the enlisted who make up most of the command. Can you talk about the SEAL Team 6 officer who made so called bleed out videos? He wasn't an officer, he was a, uh, an enlisted. Uh, uh, he was enlisted. He was a very troubled uh, SEAL, a member of Red Team, uh, Red Squadron, uh, who um, filmed he, his job. He had a responsibility, which was to film the aftermath of an operation for intelligence gathering. So he had a camera. It was part of the normal course of duties. After an operation would end, he went around and filmed um, to identify. You know, later they could try to identify who was who had been killed in terms of the the uh, militants. And um, he began doing what he what was described to me as bleed out videos and what were known as bleed out videos within the team at the time. He would bring them back, and having uh, on the battlefield, having taunting uh, taunted uh, the people who were dying, essentially uh, telling them that they weren't they couldn't die yet, they weren't going to heaven, they weren't going to see Allah, there were no virgins, um, and then bring the videos back and then spend time reviewing them, rewinding them over and over with a group and doing a countdown to watch the last few uh, moments of a person's life as they expire. Um, and that was done. This wasn't done in uh, some corner of, you know, some, some dark hole uh, in Afghanistan. It was done at Bagram Air Base in front of a lot of people. And no one would do anything about it. It was not considered uh, morally reprehensible. And that was—we we use that as an example because um, in and of itself, it's not illegal, but it gives you a sense of, the, of sort of the dark um, nature of what this war brought uh, for members of elite special operations forces, in particular SEAL Team 6. Talk about what happened to U.S. Navy SEAL Neil Roberts. So Neil Roberts uh, was the first SEAL Team 6 member and the first special operations uh, soldier to die um, after 9-11. He uh, was killed. Um, by, he fell off the back of a helicopter during uh, Operation Anaconda in early March of 2002 uh, in eastern Afghanistan. And there be, was a later became known as the Battle for Roberts Ridge. It was an effort to save him. Um, but Roberts fell off, was killed fairly quickly uh, by al Qaeda fighters who had already established um, a stronghold on the mountaintop. Um, and dread, uh, predator drone feed later sees a, one of the fighters standing over him, uh, attempting to behead him, and in fact was mutilated him uh, very significantly. And so when his body was brought back to Bagram, and his teammates found out, not only had they lost their teammate and uh, pierced their sense of invincibility, which is appropriately built up for your your best warriors. Um, they were uh, devastated by the manner uh, and the gruesome manner in which his body had been treated. And so um, Objective Bull, which happens about 18 hours later, uh, we don't know, uh, but we believe that the uh, alleged uh, stomping in and mutilation of the uh, Civil, the unarmed uh, man, an objective bull, was objective very much. Objective bull is the story you described before. Right. That's the operation. That, that it was it. A, the beginning of what was sort of a tit for tat um, against Al Qaeda, which was you do this to ours, we'll do this to yours. Um, and but the the Roberts' death and the manner of his death really shook up SEAL Team Six. And although there have been an enormous amount of count and accounts of the Battle of Roberts Ridge and some of the heroism and valor in trying to get him back, and there were others who died. Um, what and had others who died up and on the, up didn't on the, uh, die as it was originally thought and survived and then died. Right. And so, but what was never told was this incident that happens uh, 18 hours later. And there's, it's it, looking back, it's easy to see why they wouldn't 
tell the story. But the Pentagon itself, they had announced a week after the, the bombing of an objective bull that they had killed civilians. But even then, they made uh, they said that they were associated somehow with, affiliated somehow with al-Qaeda. So they left the impression that although they killed civilians, it was a justifiable bombing. In fact, it was only civilians, and they had no intelligence whatsoever. It was a wedding party? It was. They were on their way to a wedding party, yes. Mm -hmm. Where does Brit Slabinski fit into this picture? Well, that's uh, very interesting. Brit Slabinski is sort of at the heart of all of this, although um, we have to remember that he was an enlisted SEAL and not an officer, although he became a very senior enlisted. Brit Slabinski was on Roberts Ridge. It was uh, Neil Roberts was part of his team. He was the leader of the team that went back to get uh, Neil Roberts. Uh, he won a Navy Cross for his uh, efforts. Uh, on the top of Takhar Gar, which was the mountaintop uh, in eastern Afghanistan. And he was in the meeting uh, at, at Bagram after Objective Bull, in which the discussion about how Vic Heider had uh, behaved and what he had done during Objective Bull was determined that that was just not how SEAL Team 6 was going to operate. Slabinsky was devastated by Robert's death and, uh, frankly, uh, according to sources who spoke with him at the time, he sought revenge. He wanted to go back out on the battlefield and get payback. And um, we unearthed, uh, in the course of reporting, uh, some exclusive audio that had never been uh, uh, found before of Slabinski giving an interview to an author who was writing a book about uh, Roberts Ridge, in which he describes a third operation that happens after Objective Bull in which they uh, ambushed uh, a group of al-Qaeda fighters who had been on top of Takhar Gar, who had, who had been in the Battle of Roberts Ridge. And he was a sniper who led a sniper team at the time, um, and they uh, killed roughly 18 or 19 uh, al-Qaeda fighters in eastern Afghanistan in mid-March uh, 2002. And in the audio, what you hear him talk about is the uh, operation as payback and revenge, essentially, for what happened on Roberts Ridge as a way for the guys and his men to get their confidence back, as he, I think he says, is uh, to get back in the saddle again. Let's go to the SEAL Team 6 member, Britt Slabinski, here describing the aftermath of an operation to take down a convoy uh, they believed was filled with al-Qaeda fighters trying to escape to Pakistan. Uh, Slabinski and the team of snipers had killed, um, what, nearly 20 al-Qaeda um, fighters. fighters. After I shot this dude in the head, there was a guy that had his feet, just his feet sticking out of some little rut or something over here. Uh, I mean, he was dead, but I mean, you know, got, people got nervous. I shot him about 20 times in the legs. And every time you kick him or shoot him, he would kip up. And you could see his body twitch and all that. And it was like a game. I'm like, yeah, this dude. And the guy was just, you know, twitching mean, again. It was, uh, yeah, good therapy. Yeah, all bad. It was really good therapy for everybody that was there. So that's uh, Navy uh, SEAL Team 6 member Britt Slabinski, uh, this audio being played publicly for the first time that right. you got at The Intercept. And the significance of this? Well, I think what it does is it gives you a window into the mindset of someone who became a very senior. First of all, he was, after uh, the Battle of, of Roberts Ridge, he became a legendary SEAL. He had a Navy cross. He was a hero. He became a very influential member of SEAL Team 6 and at a command that is um, referred to and known as an enlisted mafia, run effectively by the enlisted SEALs who spend a decade or more in the unit, he was a top leader. And as a result, he ended up in a position uh, running a squadron, and there were a series of events that occurred that I report uh, exclusively for the first time about the fallout of his leadership. And what you get to see, what you get to hear in that is the mindset. I mean, I, the thing that was uh, most disturbing to me, I think, in listening to it was the gleefulness in his voice, um, that it was therapy for him. And I don't, th that I think gives us some understanding. And as I, I, I was talking to an, a former senior leader of SEAL Team 6 about that tape, he had never heard it, and I, I showed him the transcript. And, and one of the things he said, he said, what's so scary is, is that this guy undoubtedly influenced so many of our guys with that kind of attitude. Matthew Cole, one of the most disturbing forms of atrocities Navy, uh, the SEAL Team 6 committed, was called canoeing. 
If you can talk about that, and then talk about whether you believe Osama bin Laden was canoed. Yeah, so um, one of the—I would say one of the, if not the darkest secret um, in the last 15 years is that, uh, over the course of the wars, SEAL Team 6, as well as uh, other elements of JSOC, um, were involved in what, something called canoeing, which is a form of firing a bullet uh, in the top of the forehead that splits the head open uh, in the most gruesome manner and leaves, frankly, the brain matter exposed and looks like a—, um, a puts the head, the top of the head, in the shape of a V with a negative space that looks like a canoe uh, would fit in there or that a canoe went through it. And it can happen incidentally in battle, and it does happen incidentally in battle. What I found uh, was that for a period of years, SEAL Team 6 was photographing—they photographed their dead uh, for uh, documentation and preservation. And for a period of years, uh, canoed uh, dead took up uh, an enormous amount of, of space uh, in those in that catalog, and it was not mathematically possible. And what my sources said were, it became a sport. When you 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 shoot a person when they're dead or dying at very close range, um, for the sake of 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 seeing the gruesome uh, results. And Osama bin Laden. Well, what happened to Osama bin Laden was hiding sort of in plain sight. The man who claims that he killed Osama bin Laden, Robert O'Neill, did an interview, a long interview in Esquire in 2013, in which he described what bin Laden's face looked like after he shot him three times in the face and forehead. And there it is, without using the word canoe, he describes this gruesome scene of splitting the top of his skull open into a V, uh, or, you know, with a, a, the negative space in the shape of a V, and his brain matter exposed. And one of the points that I make in the story is, is that, that SEAL Team 6 then branded Osama bin Laden. That was—it's it's an act of, of dominance, and it is a form of, of sport, and it's reflexive. And it doesn't—in this case, um, it does not necessarily mean that Robert O'Neill committed a war crime, uh, but there is no question that the, uh, the ritualistic manner in which and the frequency in which it occurred and the fact that it had no military necessity um, uh, was criminal. You believe that bin Laden was killed unarmed and in the dark? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, one of the things that my story uh, presents fairly conclusively is that uh, the order from the beginning was to kill him, regardless of the situation inside. Uh, and in fact, one of my sources, who was a we have senior, four seconds. senior member, said, "Kill him, bring the body back." That was the order. We're going to do part two of this conversation. Post online at democracynow.org. Matthew Cole will link to your piece at the Intercept. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.